Welcome to Bible Fiber, where we are encountering the textures and shades of the biblical tapestry through 12 minor prophets, two reformers, and one exile. I am Shelley Neese, president of the Jerusalem Connection, a Christian organization devoted to sharing the story of the people of Israel, both ancient and modern. This week, we are studying Ezekiel 9, a continuation of the vision that began in chapter 8 with the prophet's depressing sneak peek into Jerusalem's abominations. Presumably, Ezekiel remained in his home with his visitors, but he sat there in an altered state of consciousness as the vision played out. After showing Ezekiel the reprehensible practices in the temple, Yahweh pronounced judgment on Judah. At three different points, Yahweh reiterated that his pity had run out. His compassion tank was on empty. Ezekiel watched as God summoned six executioners forward to take their places in the temple. The executioners each wielded their own weapon for slaughter. Initially, Ezekiel referred to them as guards, but it was evident that their task was not to protect the temple city, even though they emerged from the upper gate of the temple. Although he also referred to them as men, they displayed certain angelic qualities as they carried out Yahweh's will. Besides the six executioners, God summoned one scribe, a man dressed in linen with a writing kit strapped to his side. The word Ezekiel used for writing kit was an Egyptian loan word used for professional scribes carrying pouches. The pouch contained a writing palette, a pen, and two colors of ink. In the Bible, linen clothing was usually associated with priests, but angels also dressed in linen. For a moment, the prophet's attention turned from executioners to the inner sanctum of the temple. He noticed that the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub on which it rested to the entryway of the temple. Although Ezekiel was from a priestly family, he was not the high priest and would not normally have access to the Holy of Holies nor would he have been able to see inside the interior of the temple from his vantage point in the courtyard. It is important to remember that Ezekiel's vision should not be overanalyzed. They were dreamlike in that they defied normal logic or rules of movement. For example, God's glory was all over the place in the vision. When Ezekiel first beheld God's glory, he had spoken to him from his mobile throne chariot. In the tour of the temple abominations, God was Ezekiel's guide. And in this vision, God was back in the temple where most Jewish believers would have expected to find Yahweh. According to Jewish understanding, his presence sat atop the Ark of the Covenant's mercy seat. The cherub Ezekiel mentioned was one of the two statues that King Solomon had originally placed on each side of the Ark. Although their height is unknown, The Bible describes their 15-foot wingspan as stretching across the entire length of the room. Ezekiel's mention of Yahweh's stirring within the temple was almost parenthetical, but it foreshadowed the most climatic moment in the first half of Ezekiel, when Yahweh would depart Jerusalem completely. The six armed men waited by the temple's bronze altar for Yahweh's signal to dispense his judgment. Mercifully, The first set of instructions were to the scribe, go through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of those who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. The scribe's job was to separate the faithful from the unfaithful. Interestingly, the criteria for selection were whether they were visibly and audibly grieving Jerusalem's spiritual decline. In distinguishing between the repentant and unrepentant, Yahweh was looking for passion and zeal. Those who were quietly discomforted by idolatry but remained silent in their protest did not receive the saving mark. The mark was reserved only for those who loudly lamented Jerusalem's rebellion and protested the rampant sin that had taken over the city. The scribe moved through Jerusalem, marking the righteous with a tav on their forehead. Tav is the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Scholars don't quite know what the letter was meant to represent. In the block script still used today, Tav is rectangular. But in the Paleo-Hebrew cursive script, 
the letter was written as two intersecting lines. It looked like an X. When the slayers were told to move through the city, they had to spare all X-marked inhabitants. Christian thinkers in the early church, like Origen and Tertullian, were quick to notice that an X mark was also cross-like in appearance. It suited Christian theology to think of Ezekiel's imagery as symbolic of Christians who are saved by the work of Jesus on the cross. However, suffice it to say, Ezekiel's original message was specific to the coming destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians. The X mark survivors represented the remnant of Israel who would survive the exile and rebuild the nation. Ezekiel's vision, as strange as it might sound, was not the first time in the Bible that God placed a physical marker on the righteous to spare them from his wrath. The most obvious comparison is from Passover. On the night that the angel of death passed over Egypt, killing the firstborn in every Egyptian home, the Israelites who covered their doorposts with the blood of the lamb were spared. Also, Rahab, the righteous prostitute, was told to hang a scarlet cord from her window to save her family during the Israelite assault on Jericho. From the very beginning of the covenant people's history, God had Abraham undergo circumcision as a symbol of his dedication and obedience. Circumcision continued to be a visible and permanent marker separating Abraham's descendants from the surrounding peoples. When Moses neglected to circumcise his son, the Lord would have killed him had it not been for the quick knife work of his wife Zipporah. Ezekiel's imagery of righteous folk bearing a permanent mark on their foreheads inspired later apocalyptic literature. In Revelation, 144,000 believers appeared with Jesus on Mount Zion with a visible seal on their foreheads. Once the scribe's task was complete, Yahweh ordered the six executioners to move through the city, cutting down everyone without the forehead marking, no matter if they were women, the elderly, or the children. Their starting point was the temple courtyard where the elders from the previous vision were still gathered to worship the sun. Quickly, the temple courtyard turned into a slaughterhouse. According to the laws of the Torah, dead bodies were forbidden from coming near the temple, and priests were forbidden from touching corpses. However, their idolatry had already defiled the temple. God commanded the slayers, defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Purity concerns were a thing of the past. Ezekiel's vision had apocalyptic qualities, but technically, he was envisioning events set to happen in only five years' time. The Babylonians attacked and burned Jerusalem in 587 BCE. Like the executioners and Ezekiel's vision, they slaughtered everyone in their path without discrimination or pity. Ezekiel's vision offered a prophetic interpretation of a future event. The Babylonians were God's agents of destruction. He summoned them. It might appear to other nations that the God of Israel was taken off guard by the Babylonian attack. Because of the prophets, exiled Israelites could look back on their plight and understand that God had tried to warn them for decades. Their exile did not challenge God's sovereignty. It proved God's sovereignty. While Ezekiel stood alone witnessing the carnage, he fell prostrate on his face and cried out to God for mercy. Overwhelmed, he said, Ah, Lord God, will you destroy all who remain of Israel as you pour out your wrath upon Jerusalem? The prophet worried that after the slaughter, the Israelites would be extinct without even a surviving remnant. His angst was so sincere. When God first called him to the prophetic office, he made his forehead hard like flint to withstand the callous response of his audience. However, nothing prepared him for the violent actions of God. He tried to intercede on behalf of the people. Jeremiah, his contemporary ministering from Jerusalem, also tried to intervene before the carnage started. It was too late. Rather than answering Ezekiel directly, God justified his judgment. He reiterated that he could no longer tolerate their infidelity, violence, and injustice. He said, The guilt of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. 
The land is full of bloodshed and the city full of perversity. Although God's reply may have left the prophet unsatisfied, Ezekiel's actual answer came by way of the scribe. The prophet reported, Then the man clothed in linen with the writing case at his side brought back words saying, I have done as you commanded me. The scribe's task was to ensure that the righteous and unrighteous experienced different fates. His laconic announcement that he completed his task meant that the remnant was secure. Ezekiel's predecessors had long pointed to a remnant that would be purified from the trials and trauma and go on to rebuild the nation. The promise of the remnant was Ezekiel's last hope. There's a lot more to say about the remnant in chapter 11. One question that naturally arises from the scribe's actions is, did God save all the righteous people of Judah from death during the Babylonian attack? No one can say for certain. However, that is not the way God works in the world today when horrible things happen. Righteous people die alongside everyone else in wars, accidents, and terrorist attacks. Righteous people are diagnosed with cancer and die in car wrecks. It's a dangerous way of thinking to assume only those who miraculously survive life-threatening events are right with the Lord. What I believe based on the rest of Scripture's description of a remnant is that many of the X-marked people survived the attack and became the progenitors of the revived nation of Israel. However, I am sure that the righteous people were also inadvertently killed during their attack. Perhaps from the standpoint of eternity, their death was only a departure from the present life, but they were secure in their eternal life. When God promised to separate the faithful and unfaithful, it might not have only related to the earthly dimension of life. Although the day of judgment, predicted in Ezekiel 9, was fulfilled with the Babylonian attack in 586 BCE, the New Testament also spoke of a day when the righteous would be sorted out from the unrighteous. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus told a parable of a shepherd tasked with separating the sheep and his flock from the goats. The sheep represented the righteous who treated others with loving kindness and honored God. When they fed the hungry, clothed the naked, gave water to the thirsty, and welcomed strangers, they were serving and honoring Christ himself. The goats, on the other hand, represented the unrighteous. They lacked compassion and only cared about themselves, ignoring the plight of the oppressed and marginalized. On the day of judgment, God would put the sheep at his right hand and the goats on his left. The sheep would be rewarded with eternal life while the goats would receive eternal punishment. Thank you for listening and please continue to take part in this Bible reading challenge. Next week, we are reading Ezekiel 10. For all the biblical references each week, please see the show transcript on our blog or by signing up for our emails at thejerusalemconnection.us. I don't say all the references in the podcast, but they are all in the transcript. Send me a message, I'll respond. Bible Fiber is available on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast. Shabbat Shalom.